Hello, and welcome to another episode of Hacking with Friends. My name is Cody Kinsey. I am a security researcher at Veronis, and today we have a special guest, Alex Lin, on to answer some of the questions that have been asked on our YouTube channel over, well, the last couple of weeks. So if you haven't been to the Q&A before, we are going to be answering your questions about hacking, hacking careers, what we do, really anything you'd like to ask us within reason, we are perfectly willing to answer. And while usually we do this live, we had some technical issues today. So we're going to be focusing on the various questions that were submitted on our YouTube channel, on my Twitter, and via other means. So if you want your question included, make sure to leave them on my Twitter or on our YouTube channel, and we will make sure to answer them on the next Q&A session. All right, so we have a lot going on this week. And in particular, one thing I wanted to touch on is the Wi-Fi Nugget. So Alex, what, what is the Wi-Fi Nugget? The Wi-Fi Nugget is this little beginner kit that we created to teach a variety of different things. We've been focusing mostly on Wi-Fi security recently and developing different programs for beginners to learn different aspects of ways you can do Wi-Fi hacking or other things like that. Yeah, and it's also it. a cute little DIY kit, so you can assemble it yourself and learn how to solder, how to 3D print, stuff like that. Yeah, so this is an open source project, so if you want to go and make your own Wi-Fi nugget, you absolutely can. Alex has made several different episodes on Hack 5 about all the different cool stuff you can do with this, but really the fact that it's kind of cat-shaped and, ador and adorable is what I think a lot of people like. We have now made over 100 of these cute little cat-shaped <laughs> boards. Right to teach people about everything from MicroPython programming all the way to Wi-Fi hacking. So this has been a really fun and cool project. And I just want to thank everybody that bought one of these or who has otherwise contributed. Our friend Arsenis wrote actually a, a MicroPython binary just for this. So if you're a MicroPython enthusiast, this board is now supported very well on MicroPython. And in fact, we raised some money for a local hackerspace called Null Space Labs by hosting a lab where a bunch of total beginners came in. Well, actually some of them had some experience, but mm. mostly beginners came in, soldered this together, and then learned how to set it up and use it. So it was really cool to hang out at Null Space Labs again and see a bunch of people there. It was also really awesome to raise some money for them because they're a great community. And if you live in Los Angeles and you haven't checked it out, they have a lot of really awesome classes and they've done some really cool things for the community. So big shout out to everybody who came to our class in Los Angeles. It was awesome to meet all of you and it was really, really fun to put together some nuggets. And hopefully we'll be able to take this show on the road and maybe go on and do something like uh, hacker conferences and other things yeah. as all of the different conferences open up and we can start seeing people in person again. So yeah, if you like this project, make sure to keep an eye on it. And if you have any nugget related questions, feel free to ask us because uh, we've done a lot of work on this all the way from designing new software. Uh, Alex just came out with a friend finder so you can mm -hmm. tell when certain devices are in range all the way through designing a crush resistant case after a couple of our nuggets were damaged in transit. <laughs> um, and then uh, having to 3D print over, I think like 45 of them at a yeah. rapid pace. So you might want to been... show that video later, <laughs> the yeah. crush resistant one. No. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Per perhaps we will. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, that was uh, kind of our last week was making a bunch of nuggets and answering a bunch of questions about the Wi-Fi nugget from people who bought them. So again, if you bought one, then we really appreciate that. And if you want to buy one, there are still a couple left at hackat.com, H-A-K-C-A-T.com. But you can also find them, uh, again, in probably in stock again on hopefully around the 10th or something like that. Yeah. So if you want to build your own, though, you can also do that. And Alex has instructions on Hack5 on how to put together your own kind of hack together version uh, yeah, but it's a very cool project and we've been working really hard on it. So yeah, uh, let's go ahead and go to one of the questions that we got from our YouTube channel. Cool. Uh, first question for the day. Who is the better hacker, a self-taught mm. or an MIT hacker? This is a really good question, um, but I would start out with the question of a better hacker at what? Because I have a couple friends who are really, really good at things that they just don't really teach in mm. school. Um, things that are very, very uh, focused and specific that they learn from like messing with video games and like reversing them or like finding out how to work with other sorts of ways of breaking software that's already been created. So there are some niches that are very, very specific where you can have a computer science background and you can be a good generalist when it comes to computer science and know a lot about uh, computer science and context. But somebody who's like a super specialist on one really like like specific but very important thing can totally smoke you at that at that right. topic, provided that's what we're talking about. So hacking is kind of hard because there's generalists and then there's specialists. And a generalist will know a lot about the overall topic and will probably know the steps you need to go through in order to conduct. For example, 
a really thorough penetration task. But they might not know how to, they might not be a master at every single individual step. They're more of a master of the process. Whereas, you know, somebody who's just exceptional at SCADA hacking, like industrial hacking, maybe they would be a way better hacker um, in that one context, like hacking hmm. a factory or like a nuclear facility or something. Then, you know, somebody who's a super specialist on this one type of SCADA hacking might be able to do laps around someone at MIT who's a great generalist, but you know, has never done a deep dive into one of these really niche areas. So it's a really hard question to answer because frequently people with very specific skills are highly rewarded for them. But another surefire way of doing well in the industry is just to be a good generalist. I myself am kind of both. I try to be a good generalist, but at the same time, um, I'm much more focused on like open source intelligence and Wi-Fi. Um, Alex, w what are your thoughts? Um, I would say pretty much the same thing. There's too many different areas of hacking to properly answer this question. But um, in the same sense, I also focus mostly on like hardware hacking and things like that. I'm not too much of a generalist, although I do have um, kind of a broad purview when it comes to my hacking knowledge, I guess, hmm. but not too in depth on specific things. Yeah. So what's your opinion then? MIT hacker or self-taught hacker? Um, <laughs> shoot. Maybe self-taught hacker, I think, because I think um, as a self-taught hacker, you just take in more information rather than going for like a qualification from whatever MIT offers. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, in some ways, like an MIT hacker would probably have a better, um, broader background or understanding. So they might be able to find the fastest way to get something done. So again, like I would say it's hard to know. Having a really broad educational palette and having all these tools to be able to solve a problem definitely gives you a huge advantage. So I'm not saying that an MIT education doesn't matter, but you know, when it comes to having specific knowledge or being a specialist, there's still definitely ways you can compete. So I would say in general, I mean, if you had the money to be an hmm. MIT hacker, then that would be a pretty surefire way of making sure you're pretty good at that. But if you don't, then being a specialist is another good way of being able to make sure you know a lot about something you're good at and you're able to capitalize off of it. All right, what's the next question? Would love it if you guys react okay. to Watch Dogs. Hmm, so I have actually never played Watch Dogs, but I've heard a lot of feedback about this. And in particular, there are some writers that I worked with when I was at Nullbyte who designed a device that was based off of Watch Dogs. And it was really cool. Mm -hmm. um, it was called the Sonic Pie, but then they had to change it because um, somebody else was making like an art music music project called the Sonic Pie. So in the end, like uh, they, yeah, they had to change it. What did it do? Um, it was a Raspberry Pi based project that did a bunch of like networking and hacking stuff. And mm -hmm. I wish I could look it up, but I do not remember what he changed it to after he changed from the Sonic Pie. So if I Googled it, I'm sure I would just get this musical yeah. project. But yeah, long story short, like this uh, video game series has been inspiring people to get interested in hacking for a while. So it would actually be really cool to do something on Watch Dogs, especially because we had such a negative experience doing Hackers React series on anything that was like a TV show or a movie. Um, they just really, 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 really like to copyright flag that stuff. And from a creator standpoint, it's a very long and very annoying process to get all that stuff taken care of. So, um, you know, like we're, we were a little reticent to do any more reaction series, even though they did really well and we thought they were fun. Um, the actual process of posting them and responding to like six copyright claims was like really taxing mm -hmm. and actually in some cases made it so we couldn't upload videos for a couple of days, which was really disruptive. So we really want to bring more content around that. But from the creator side of things, it's just crazy how if you use something and even it, it can be totally obviously fair use, there's just companies who will work on behalf of, you know, like, uh, like big media groups and just automatically deny every content claim just to make it so that the majority of them are taken down because creators don't feel the need to challenge it. But effectively what you have to do is you have to challenge it so that they have to sue you in order to take it down. And, um, yeah, like that, that just is way more work than the average creator is willing to do. And that's why you might not see as many of these. It, it's because it's really disruptive for your channel and it's actually quite annoying to me. So Watch Dogs might be our solution to that because it's a video game. It's not as uh, uh, mm. as heavily enforced as maybe a movie, but I guess we'll find out. So it's a lot of trouble though. <laughs> yeah. Have you played Watch Dogs? Or do you know no, much I about haven't. it? All I know is it's just like vaguely hacker related and seems to be popular. It's not but... vaguely hacker related. It's like <laughs> it's... you hack stuff in the, you hack stuff in it constantly. As like I know they, point. there's some like stretches in the, way that things are hacked in the game. That's all I know. 
Okay. It, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. So like, um, I again, I've never played it, and I, I I don't think I've even really watched like playthroughs. But I know that like in the game, like you are you have to like hack like smart objects and like mm. like things in the city and whatever else, and, and that that's how you get stuff done. So it makes you think about the ways you could use stuff around you to further your goals. And for a lot of people, you know, looking at the world as like exploitable is a really, really cool thing because, you know, you're suddenly looking at like traffic lights and like other things that everybody has to interact with and be like, if I controlled that, what could I do? So I think the instinct of just like being able to look around and find things that could be hacked and thinking about who could hack this to benefit in some way, yeah. that is really the future. And I think it's cool that the game built it in. So yeah. I would like to definitely react to that. So if, if you want to see us do a react to, uh, to Watch Dogs series, then let us know. We'll get on it. All right, what is the next question? Hopefully you guys can react to some scenes <laughs> <laughs> from the movie <laughs> Takedown. It's the movie done about Kevin Mitnick. Ah, well, it would be very ironic to get a bunch of takedowns from, um, I was from say that. Mitnick on. So oh. I am actually... Um, I was going to say if our video got taken down. Yeah, it would be very ironic <laughs> if our video got taken down, especially if it was about um, Kevin Mitnick. So um, I just am really curious. I'm going to... I'm going to, on my Twitter, go to Kevin Mitnick, and I think you'll see it, it doesn't come up. And um, that's because he... Oh, did he block you? He blocked me. No way. Uh, yeah, so if you want evidence, then... <laughs> <laughs> that's quite an accomplishment. Yeah, so... Um, uh, yeah, we can do that. I don't care. That guy can't see what I say anyway, because he freaking blocked me. Um, so yeah, uh, nice. we, we can do that. Yeah, yeah we, we can do that. Um, a very, a very funny, um, a very funny turn of events. But yeah, so, um, okay, we could do something on the origin of Kevin Mitnick. It might not be, like, nice, though, um, because a lot of people, uh, you know, Kevin Mitnick did some really cool stuff, for yeah. sure. And what's funny is when I first started getting um, interested in going to the press area at RSA as a journalist, I met lots of people who, like, like reported on Kevin Mitnick or, like, like, interviewed him or whatever, and they all had really, really favorable impressions of him, which was I thought was interesting because as soon as I walked to the other side of the room where the security people were and not the journalists, they did not like him because hmm, of really. a bunch of different reasons. Mostly, like, um, in, in recent years, he's been accused many times of, of stealing credit for other people's work. There's a lot of people who are just like, this guy doesn't have any original stuff anymore. He's hmm. really just kind of taking credit for other people's things. And a lot of those original creators got pretty pissed about this and were very vocal and like, called him out for it. So a lot of people in the security community have really, like, you know, um, <laughs> in the bathroom... I'll, all I'll say, and again, I'm just reporting the news here, is that um, when you go into the bathroom of uh, the local hackerspace, there's a sticker that just says, put Kevin back. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, the security community is not necessarily a big thing, which is funny because when people get into it, they're like, oh, legendary hacker guy, Kevin, and then you start talking to people and they're like, mm. he stole credit for my friend's project and then like doubled Dang. down on it and tried to copyright it. It was really lame. There's some stuff like that. So again, not trying to spread room. I'm just saying the security community has a different view so it would be kind of interesting to go through and just watch the documentary and kind of see why so many of the, I mean, I've, I've done some preliminary research, but why so many of the journalists were really just like thought that he was like the expert or the person to talk to, mostly because of their past interactions when he was very much a subject of, of lots and lots of news. So um, yeah, again, don't, don't want to talk any smack here. I have no personal experience other than um, him posting some whack stuff on Twitter and then um, blocking me after I, I responded. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, you get, you get blocked sometimes. Nice. Uh, but okay. Yeah. So I think maybe we'll take a look at this, uh, and provided we can strike a neutral tone, I think that that could be a lot of fun. Um, and maybe it gets taken down. Maybe it doesn't. I don't know if we can spend a full hour doing it though. So we might need to find some, some time doing other stuff, but all right, let's do another question. Cool. <clears throat> do you have a way to contact you? Information here was good, but I have some details involving these types of attacks. That is heavily unknown, except in certain underground places. Our consultation rate is on our website. And if you would like us to consult on your specific and individual weird case, um, we're generally not available. Um, I'm kidding. We, we don't have no consultation rate and we don't have a website. But uh, We yeah. do have your Twitter and yeah, the very we, strange DMs you get. Yeah, I'm sorry. All right, so if we go over to my screen, then... Um, <laughs> I get lots of questions about just random stuff. Um, like, uh, I hello, bro. How are you? Yeah, I, most of this, most of these are questions about like highly specific 
uh, like like stuff, like they're stalking someone or their girlfriend or something, and I just can't answer your case. Like I'm not a, so people people like oh you're good at computers, you're like Geek Squad, right? You can help me with my computer. No, I break computers, and I don't even break computers to like spy on people. I, well, I, I guess kind of sort of with the Wi-Fi stuff, but I mostly just break computers to teach other people about breaking computers. And that's that's my job. That's great. But I cannot fix your computer. I cannot Hack help you. you like commit crimes by breaking into someone else's computer that didn't consent. And um, I, I, I am not paid to look at technical problems for random people on the Internet. So. I, I just think it's very funny that like people see my video where I my videos on YouTube where they're like, hey, like this guy knows about computers and like my Dell from 1995 for some reason cannot access the optical disc. Can you take 20 <laughs> to 20 minutes to five hours of your time to diagnose this problem for me? Here's a blurry screenshot. Um, I can't I, I can't help you. I'm sorry. Um, so, yes, I, I get a lot of questions. Some of them are very nice, like this one right here. I, f I was like a little unsure what this meant. I translated it and it just means peace be upon you. That's sweet. So sometimes I just get, um, I just get messages that are nice. And then, like for this one, I'm just like, thanks. But if, it, if you've got some question that's like crazy, then, uh, you know, I'm really, I'm really reticent to answer it. So let's go yeah. ahead and go on to the next All question. Right. Not saying this question was crazy. I'm just saying, uh, any question that involves like me helping you work on technical details is probably going to be enough for me. How does malware connect to and keep persistent connection to a C2 server? Different methods and diagrams, etc. throughs would be super interesting and helpful. Hey, this is a great question that almost dissolved its own, deserves its own episode, honestly. Yeah. Um, because malware C2 connection is like part of the life cycle of malware. So, all right. So let, let's talk about malware to begin with. Like, what does malware um, as an entity need to do in order to survive? Like, as like a little life form. It needs to get into where it needs to go. So it needs to immediately first get, like, get penetration onto the target and be able to inject code or do something on the target. So that's step one. Step two is persistence. It needs to make sure that if it's knocked out or, or something happens, it's able to reassert itself. So then we have persistence. And then we also have communication. So we need to be able to report back and get instructions. Because you know, depending on the target, the operator of the malware might want to do a number of different things. They might want to do a low and slow campaign if this is a really juicy target. Or if this is just a, a really poorly defended, but kind of like not so juicy target, then maybe they just want to spring everything right away and just get right to work. Um, it really depends on levels uh, of kind of spreading around the organization, escalating privileges. But the, the C2 stage is really interesting because it is a critical function for malware to survive. I mean, in order for it to persist, it really needs to, at some point, connect back to a control server and get instructions, unless it's something highly specialized like Suxnet. Um, so Suxnet was interesting because it didn't need a C2 server, and it was designed to be attacking things that were totally offline. And what instead it had to do was have this incredibly complicated system of selection where it would only run if all of these certain conditions were met. Now, that's not typical of malware. Usually malware is just looking to infect anything in a broad range of machines. And then when it comes back, uh, or when it connects back, it'll tell the mal malware operators what kind of platform it's running on and where it's running. And then it'll pull down the appropriate modules to do whatever it needs to do next. That means that the malware can keep a really light footprint. So it doesn't need to have everything immediately loaded at the start. It can load everything in response to communicating with a C2 server. And that makes it a lot smarter and a lot harder to detect. But that C2 communication is a vulnerability. It means that somehow the malware needs to connect back and communicate with its operator. So, Alex, how would how would you do this if you were a malware creator? Um, having not created <laughs> malware, but something similar like the ESP bug, um, I just set it up to connect to like a remote server, create like a post request that sends information back and forth. I think that's the simplest way to do it. But yeah, letting absolutely. it fly under the radar is kind of hard. I don't really have experience with that because, like, something like that can easily be sniffed for information that's that might be um, allowing it to be detected. Right. So, as Alex said, the most simple way of doing this is just a post request, like just being able to send a post request out that uh, communicates with the server and then comes back. It's not encrypted, so if anybody is sniffing the connection or looking for malicious stuff, then they will probably see it. Um, so this means that you could be encrypting the contents of the post request, but the actual post request itself is pretty obvious. And as soon as you start pulling down data, then you know you're, you might be detected. Yeah. So the next level up 
would be DNS exfiltration or DNS communication. Mm -hmm. Now, DNS is n not supposed to be for communication. What is what is DNS supposed to be? Um, I think it... I don't know how to exactly describe it. I think it contains, like, packet headers for... DNS? Yeah. You can exfiltrate stuff, like, in things that... No, what is supposed DNS to supposed to do? Oh, domain, domain name server. Just, yes. like, gives you information about the domain. Yeah, it's like the server. phone book yeah. of the internet. So DNS is originally supposed to, when you try to go to a website like uh, google.com, it's supposed to take that, turn it into an IP address via querying a bunch of servers to find out where uh, on an IP scale like the actual server is located and then connect you um, by giving you that information. So instead, an attacker can use that DNS lookup to instead exfiltrate information. So if I went to google.com slash X, Y, blah, 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 and it's a bunch of encrypted data, then I could submit a bunch of DNS requests um, that look like, you know, if you're not looking for something objectively, you know, like, like malicious, like a bunch of DNS mm. requests might just be a domain went down and like suddenly a service can't find it, you know, like there are some cases where that m might happen. But an old joke around among security professionals is like, if you like look at the logs of a client and they're just like, are you sure I've been breached? And you just show them like 10 gigabytes of DNS traffic. And it's just like, yes, you have been breached. Like DNS is a really common way to exfiltrate information nowadays. Um, but there are some other really sophisticated ways that, that uh, malware authors do it. So I have seen Instagram posts, the actual photo on the Instagram post be embedded with code. Hmm. So uh, steganography is a way of hiding information in images and other sorts of seemingly innocuous data and then posting it in public so that it can be uh, basically picked up on by a third party and then communicate it through. So these are ways that bots have worked in the past to circumvent this sort of like monitoring by avoiding DNS requests and instead like posting an image or doing something that seems innocuous but has hidden data that you need to be aware of is there in order to have a reasonable chance of decoding. So really, really super cool way. Um, this is just again, a, kind of deserves its own episode because I've already gone on for like several minutes about like just the different ways that malware can do this. but. This is also how Patrick Wardle's tools work on a macOS system. It doesn't look for like a virus signature. It looks for the behavior that malware has to do. So there's a, uh, a tool on here that allows me to see whether or not a new program is spawning connections. So if I see that like Python 3 is attempting to connect what to like xyzbadwebsite.com, I'm going to be like, no, and just hit deny. Hmm. And that allows me to you know, keep an eye on what's going on in my computer. So this is just the way that malware has to work in order to propagate, unless it's tailor-made for a specific, you know, industrial device or something like that, like Stuxnet was. So if you're looking for malware, a really good way of doing that is looking for attempting to establish a C2 connection, because that's exactly what it has to do in order to persist and survive. Cool. Another question? Yeah. All right. Please translate your language to <laughs> Arabic for learning of you. I would, I would love to do that. Unfortunately, I, I don't think um, we have the time to do that. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm working on getting the, the translation here. Um, so yeah, if let me, let me see if I can let me let's get started with with Arab. Let's try it. Okay, it's not outputting audio. Sorry, guys. What's, we can't. What does it say from Russian? Oh, translate from Arabic. Can detected the detected language Russian. Um, okay, well, that's confusing, but Please. what are you going to do? So um, I don't think that we probably have time to translate our stuff into Arabic, but if, if uh, you guys want to use Google, there's plenty of like, uh, there's also plenty of automatic trans transcription services, mm. but unfortunately we don't, we barely have enough time to publish content in English. Yeah. <laughs> All right, next question. Cody, laugh about your channel, No Bites. Uh, can you translate that for me? Yes, Cody, what about your channel, Nullbytes? Ah, uh, yes. They, they want to know what happened. So if I go over to Nullbyte, I can see that Nullbyte is about to have 800,000 subscribers. Hey. And the last video was uploaded four months ago, which actually shocks me because it feels like it was so much longer ago. It has 106,000 views. Hmm. So what's up with Nullbyte? Well, um, the company behind Nullbyte was um, getting bought. Uh, they wanted to sell it, and I think somebody bought part of it, but then backed out at the last minute or something. I don't actually really know what's going on there, but I just know that it's a, probably still for sale. And because no one um, has paid for it, nobody owns the properties mm. associated, which are um, Nullbyte and I think, um, what's their other one? Gadget Hacks. 
So um, yeah, I used to work for this company, I, but Nullbyte was never mine. Nullbyte existed before I came around, but I created the Nullbyte channel. So I am I am the creator of the Nullbyte channel, and I say that confidently because they told me not to do that, and I did it anyway. So I did that. Um, but you know, I never owned it because I worked for them when I created it, and they assumed ownership of it, and you know, paid us for those episodes. So uh, it's their content, and I have no idea what's going to happen with it. Hmm. Um, that's why we publish on Hack5 now. So if you are a Nullbyte fan, make sure you're on Hack5, because that's where you'll find myself, Alex, and other people who used to be hosts of Nullbyte, still doing the exact same thing. So come on over and join us at Hack5, uh, and also our Redia channel. We're hoping to publish more videos on there soon, but um, yeah, it's just been, it's just been a, a crazy time switching over to Hack5, making a bunch of content for them. And um, yeah, I mean, hmm. if, if you got if you got deep pockets, go buy Nullbyte. We'll, we'll make some more videos. We can talk about it. But uh, yeah, uh, it's been it's been a trip because we worked really hard on that channel, and it's it's kind of sad to see it like sitting there for four months with no new content. But I mean, people are starting to figure out that we're on uh, Hack Five. I just wish we could like announce it on there, but you know, we don't even have access to the channel anymore, so we can't even look at the analytics. Kind of sad. Hmm. All right, next question. Wouldn't you rather install an invasive and insecure service instead of having to actually speak with your kid? I mean, what parent has time to know how their child is doing these days? So this app will probably be very popular, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. So we were talking about this weird app that was being offered on Instagram that was like gaslighting parents into being afraid that their child is not being honest with them. Yeah, so that like, sucks. Yeah. So the ad was like, they're just like, hey, how's your day? And the kid's like, fine. And because like maybe the kid's just having a fine day and they're busy, but then the app um, says in the sidebar, like what they really mean is like, oh, I'm so stressed out today. I'm so upset. I'm stressed out about menial stuff. I'm a teenager and I'm so angsty. My friend was mean to me, but hasn't like added me back to a group chat and uh, it's just like, okay. That was exactly what it said. Yeah, that's like pretty much what it said. And just like, none of it was like really serious. It just seemed like the kid was having a little bit of a stressful day. But basically the, the ad was just like, you should invade your child's privacy by letting us monitor all of their communication with all of their friends and everything else. And basically report back to you about what's happening in your child's personal life. And if you don't do that, then your child's going to lie to you and you're going to be a bad parent. So mm. like this kind of ad, I feel like is very seductive for people who like genuinely don't feel like interacting with their kid and just want to be able to discipline them when necessary. Um, I feel like it's very lazy parenting to rely on basically invading your child's privacy to figure out what's going on and not just having like trust or honesty or any sort of communication with them. Like if your relationship with your kid is that far gone, like I, I don't think that spyware is going to help in anything. It's just going to make you a more abusive parent, frankly. Um, so we really like we both Alice and I really don't like this. Yeah. Like it, it's a trickle down of people who develop exploits for phones that are like messy exploits that take a lot of steps. So you really have to have physical access and do all this other stuff. And once those exploits get old or if they're they require too many steps, they get resold to these companies that develop these like nasty spyware applications that are always marketed for like the best possible use case, the most innocent possible use case out of like a thousand terrible ones you can think of. So, I mean, this ad could equally say, like, is your girlfriend cheating on you? Like, hack into her phone and find out. Because, like, basically the permissions and everything else we need to do are the same. You know, there's really the only difference between using this unethically and ethically is marketing. And they're just trying to market it, again, towards paranoid parents who will take advantage of the fact that there's not really any laws for, like, abusing your child digitally and invading their privacy and, like, you know, like, doing whatever it is you're going to do. A lot of people you know, are, are feel differently about this and they feel like it's appropriate to monitor their child uh, digitally because their child is like their property until they're 18. Um, but I would say that developing a working relationship with your child as they transition into adulthood based on trust is kind of something that like is undercut by using digital surveillance to take away whatever developing privacy and sense of self they have. Yeah, I Who think knows? that's just like destructive of whatever relationship there is if you're spying on them like that. And honestly, the the other use case here is domestic abuse. Mm -hmm. um, if you're a, a controlling, you know, domestic abuser, and you're going after, you know, your child, you're going after your spouse, you're going after like somebody in your family where you have physical access to their phone or a position of control over them. This enables it even more, which is why we hate this stuff because it's the worst possible application for technology. It's really just making it worse. Um, for other people to know you. So if you're someone who uses this kind of spyware and stuff, you should really reconsider the way that it invades other people's privacy and gives you a kind of um, like false sense of superiority over these people and like the sense of control. Because like somebody can just turn around and do this stuff to you. And in fact, like when 
when you think about a world where it's so easy to do this, it's really not appealing. So I, I'm just very turned off by this sort of thing. I think we can universally say that that is not something that we endorse, like, or um, <laughs> sign yeah, up on. I hate it. Have you guys done <clears throat> an overview on downgrading encryption? Example, given what you said about WPA3 to WPA2, it would be great. I find general overviews more enjoyable hmm. than step-by-steps as they let you see the logical whole without getting stuck in the techniques and procedures. Hey, I really like this, que uh, this uh, question. Yeah, thank you very much for this comment because honestly, like we often wonder what the right balance of technical content is with actually just having, you know, like, like a general overview that everyone can understand. So we've been trying a lot of both and it's really great to hear the kind of like simple clear feedback that lets us know what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. So yeah, we like this a lot. Um, Downgrading encryption is really cool. There's a lot of different use cases of this. Everything from SSL stripping to you know downgrading WPA3 to WPA2. And it would be great to do some examples on this. So we will try to find some that we can do relatively soon, but I'll, some of this will require us, uh, like SSL stripping is like not necessarily um, easy um, or like super simple. So or at least I haven't been able to get it to be. Um, but in general, the, the attack here is when you're dealing with uh, any sort of communication protocol. There's usually a range of different encryption types that are, are enabled to allow older devices to still work with the standard. So if you just basically pick the weakest type of encryption, um, then this sort of downgrade attack basically sets the security level automatically to the lowest possible setting within the communication you're having with any particular device. That could be Wi-Fi, it could be like any other sort of communication you're negotiating, like a SSL connection. If you are telling the server that you're the oldest, slowest computer that can only support the weakest encryption, that is a very useful attack to have because it, it means that you are downgrading the attack surface that you were working against. So downgrading encryption attacks are great. We'll try to focus on one, but it's a little, it's a little bit complicated in some context. So if anybody has suggestions for relatively simple uh, downgrade attacks, I would love to hear about them because most of the ones I know about are a little bit more involved mm -hmm. and I would like to do more of a bite-sized one. Thank you for this question. It's very thoughtful yeah. and I liked it a lot. That'd be cool. And it would be fun to do a demonstration on. Yeah, definitely. Cool. How to defeating facial recognition systems. Ah, you have what a, a great video on that, question. So on Hack 5, we have a facial recognition episode that's defeating re facial recognition. So this was one of our first episodes and it was so cool. Um, <laughs> shush me. Um, and we had our friend Vic come on and basically teach us about the different ways that it was likely for us to defeat facial recognition, like putting something in the middle of the uh, glasses and some other stuff. So then we went and tried it. We had a makeup artist come and we actually had that makeup artist paint uh, our production assistant, Mike. Well, hmm. hi, Michael. Uh, we had him, uh, them paint Michael's face and try to see whether or not it was able to detect it. And we had our friend Tim explain the facial recognition process and the different algorithms that we were using. And then we tried things like tilting the head to the side and on some simple uh, some simple recognition system, that was enough to defeat it just because it expected head to be right side up. But not on some of the more like Python ones. So then we tried putting a, like uh, just something to block the bridge of the nose and that had a pretty good result. So we found that to be pretty useful. It also suggests maybe something dark, um, like by the bridge of the nose, uh, might be effective, but we we did not find, find that that worked. So it, it was sometimes if you covered enough, uh, it was effective, but it was pretty obvious. Now I came up with this one. I was like, what if we put a tiny face <laughs> that's really clear and then so put weird. it, then you wear sunglasses. So like it's easier to acquire the tiny face. So we tried this and um, it didn't really work that well, but it was picking up the lady. Um, so. Another thing we tried was casting shadows. So there were also some like hats and other things that would cast like harsh shadows in order to make it so it was difficult to see all of someone's face. So I cast a shadow and tried to make it so part of the face was really bright and part of it was really dark. And it wasn't super, super effective, but it was it was still pretty good. So, okay, there's our makeup artist. And this is just putting a bunch of like angular lines on Michael's face. And in general, this went pretty well. Like we, it actually was uh, having a really hard time seeing it. So we erased as many of the lines as possible to see like what we could do. And you can see at a certain point it uh, it started getting confused uh, still, even though we were just putting a couple lines around the bridge of the nose. So it seems like you have face paint on and it goes around like your nose area. That's really critical. Um, whereas cheeks um, were good for cheap microcontrollers, but for the more sophisticated ones, 
still would be it was still able to detect you pretty well so if there's any power behind the 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 ai that's doing the recognition and it's not just running a little microcontroller then you really need to do a little bit more so what can you do well we kicked it up a notch and um we did this like burned out face that was like inverted colors so we made the lights dark on this which was pretty weird and we found that on microcontrollers it oh. actually hid pretty well huh. again not on the super powerful one but on the microcontroller it had a hard time looking at that like burnt makeup look so if you invert the lights in the darks that actually does work um which is pretty cool and then we went full clown are you done with the clown i'm always done with the clown okay good then you'll understand what we're doing here we decided to go uh full uh insane clown posse makeup and we were able to find that, yeah, no, it, it has a really hard time spotting juggalos. Like, it, it just is not a good on juggalo detector. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so good. on both of them, we were able to see that it was just not picking up. See? Well, okay. So we it did, it was able to sometimes get Michael on the more sophisticated one, but juggalo makeup, like, did a pretty decent job hmm. uh, of getting rid of his, like, facial, like, profile and making it so it was locking onto the wrong thing. So super fast overview if you want to see more detail you can go to this episode um again really really great episode it's one of my favorites we've ever done but um there are ways of defeating facial recognition we're going to try some other ones i burned out i think like 25 infrared leds trying to set some up in order to make like an infrared one for infrared cameras so we're still going to test that one in the future and there's also some reflective ones like i have some reflective glasses now that are supposed to reflect infrared light back so we'll try that as well both active and passive infrared blocking or jamming i guess you could call it so yes. Those are some ways to defeat facial recognition. All right, next question. Cool. Is Multego basically Microsoft Power BI for shady underworld data? Sort of, but I don't think Microsoft business, like whatever that is, like has entity types that work the same way as Multego that do like calls for data. No, so it's like, like analytics. Sort yeah, of. yeah. So like one of them is like an analytics suite where you got to have your own data and maybe you could plug it into one or two data sources. Multego has data. So when you have a Multego like query, it goes out and brings in a bunch of other entities that are their own entity type that have their own data pools that each individual one can do. So I can do different data pools for like a website entity than like a DNS server entity. They allow me to search for different things and plug into different data sources. And each one is set up carefully to allow you to pull in more useful information about that entity type. So like a person is going to give you different options than an email address than uh, like a, an address or a name server. Like those all will give me different options for pulling in more data. And that's why Multego is liked by so many people is it just gives you lots of different ways to conduct an investigation. Now mm -hmm. that you remind me, I need to get back to someone at Multego because they emailed me <laughs> three days ago. And I will be doing, I think, uh, like a map, uh, some sort of uh, demonstration for them pretty soon. So if you want to see more Multego stuff, stay tuned because we're going to be working on it. And I'm sorry I haven't emailed you back, Multego. All right. Um, that was our last question. All right, that was our last question. So very quickly um, on my Twitter, if anybody wants to send me a direct message with a question in it, I, I'll, I'll look through them occasionally and just know that I get traumatized. Sometimes I just get stuff like this. Oh. I don't know how to respond to this. I'm super busy. Like, what do you want? Like, what are we, are we friends now? Like, I do see that you have the Null Space Labs logo and I think that's great, but I don't, hi, I'm responding right now. Hello. Um, and then also please make a video on social engineering skill. Google sends my mail in spam box. Okay. Are these are these separate questions? Are they written? Or is this related? Um, these were both sent at the same time. Uh, okay, so we can make a video about social engineering skills. I, I think that would actually be, be super cool. Um, like, for example, like if we wanted to just do an overview of like hmm. some really interesting social engineering attacks and talk about the skills that went into them. Yeah? Yeah, that'd yeah. be pretty cool. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. <laughs> um, I don't know why Google sends your mail to your spam box. You might... It's unfortunate. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Um, so we agree that that's unfortunate. <laughs> Let's uh, create a video on how to set up your Gmail properly. Yes. So then... Right. Hi, sir. Um, this this is a very long question, basically about um, what to do next after you do some rubber duckies and stuff and do some certificates on Udemy. You should start producing either producing content about what you've learned or start doing bug bounties or just do something where you can get paid for what you are doing. Sounds like you've already taken the basic steps, so now you need to look for a way to start getting some industry experience, either by, like like I did, doing content about what you've learned and teaching other people what you know, or by continuing on and learning more stuff. I also went back to community college for a while to learn more about programming and networking so I could get a better job in the future. So all those things would be great ways of taking the next step. Again, going back to school for networking um, would be really, really helpful if you want to step up your knowledge. 
And I think that's, um, I just want to give a shout out uh, to, oh yeah, why did Null Byte stop uploading videos? We have answered this question. Um, but I also want to give a shout out to um, this viewer. Thank you so much for sending me the story about the um, the uh, cards in Argentina. Hmm. Um, so lots of information um, of just people that were registered in this government database. Address, phone number, unique government ID it was all uh, leaked. And I wouldn't have known about this if it wasn't for this message. So oh, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate this stuff. There's no, there's no question here other than, would you mind talking about this on your next Security Forward News? And you did. So the answer is yes. Um, okay, so that's all we have time for this week. Thank you very much to everybody who asked us questions. Sorry we were not live this week, but we will try to be live next week. So you can also add, ask questions in the chat. But if you have a question that you want answered on the next show, make sure to either leave them on my Twitter or leave them on the YouTube channel, preferably that one, because it's easier to round them up. And we will make sure to answer them on the next live Q&A. Alex, thank you very much for joining us today. Of course. And if you want to see any more great Veronis content, make sure to check out the Veronis brand channel, where you can see our sometimes host, co-host Killian doing the threat update, where he goes over threats that businesses are facing every day by malware actors. All right, that's it. We will see you guys next time. Bye.